All right, welcome. And in this video, I want to talk about artificial neural networks. Specifically, because there are many different kinds of artificial neural networks, I want to talk about a very common kind of neural network, maybe the kind that is most often referred to when we're talking about artificial neural networks, and that is the feed-forward multi-layer neural network. Um, first, I want to talk about what it means to be a feed-forward neural network. Um, and that is one where inputs start at one end of the neural network. So here, this is at the input layer at the top. The input will, will come in here. And then we feed the inputs forward. So these neurons process the input, and then we pass them along to the next set of neurons in the next layer. And then they process their input, and then again, we feed it forward. So the idea of a feed-forward network is that the input is always sort of moving forward through the network and eventually getting to the end, which is the output. And this is in contrast to other networks, uh, specifically ones that are called recurrent networks, where you may have uh, connections that don't just go forward in the network, but also go backwards, in which case the, there's a, you know, they're used for different things and they're a slightly more complicated operation because you can't just simply process the inputs in order of the layers as, as we have here. Now, feed-forward networks are also almost always called multi-layer networks as well because for you to be able to feed forward a signal, you need to have multi-layers to, to send that signal through. And um, this is very common in neural networks. It's very rare to have a neural network that isn't multi-layered, that only has a single layer. Um, those types of neural networks are not very powerful uh, or are not as powerful as compared to multi-layer networks. And of course, more modern neural networks, which we sometimes refer to as deep learning or deep neural networks, uh, we call them that because, uh, in, you know, in contrast to the example network that I have here that only has one hidden layer, uh, more modern deep neural nets are going to have multiple hidden layers. You can have more than one of these hidden layers of neurons, is, which is going to help uh, the networks compute more complicated functions or classify more complicated uh, data, which is what they're commonly used for. So yeah, so a, a multi-layer neural network typically divides its neurons into layers, and we usually give them different names. There's specifically the input layer, which is a very special purpose layer of neurons where its uh, main job is just to pass the input onto the network. Um, the idea here is that the input may not be in a form that's easily processable by neurons yet. Um, it might be an image or something like this, in which case we need to convert that uh, uh, data, whatever form it's in, into neuron data. And so that's what the, usually the input neurons are for, is just to convert whatever the data is into neuron firing so that that can start the neural network going now. Uh, the next layer or multiple layers in the middle are usually called the hidden layers. Anything in the middle is usually called hidden. Why is it called hidden? Well, from the user's perspective, if we were treating this as a black box, these would be hidden from us. We wouldn't understand how these work. Uh, we only have access to the two layers on the outside, the input layer where we can put inputs in, and then the output layer where we can read outputs from. And so the hidden layer, and, and again, there may be multiple hidden layers, are any of the layers that are inside the network that don't have an input or output function. And then I've, I've kind of already mentioned that the output layer is there to uh, produce output. So this example network here, it doesn't do anything, but this example network we could imagine takes in three bits, maybe, you know, it's a number or it refers to something, and then it's going to process, do some logical computation on those three bits, do something to them, and produce two bits of information out at the other end. Maybe it's classifying those three bits in some way. And so uh, this, the, the, the two layers that are available to the users, uh, we can see determine the size of input that we can put in, but also the kind of output that we can, that we can get out. And so those are usually the two uh, pieces that are determined by the problem statement. So we're trying to classify images that maybe are, you know, 1024 by 1024 pixels. So that will tell us how many input uh, neurons we might need. And then we're going to classify them into maybe a certain number of categories. And those categories are going to determine us how many output bits we're going to need 
uh, to uh, uniquely identify each of those you know, potential categories we might be classifying into. So again, this is just an example network that I just built up. Um, another thing that we're going to notice is that in these multi-layer uh, multi feedforward networks, it's common for connections only to exist between a layer and the next layer. So here the input layer is connected to the hidden layer, but not to the output layer. Um, signals or inputs need to go through the hidden layer to reach to the output layer. And then and similarly for the next layer, the hidden layer only is connected onto the output layer. And if we had multiple hidden layers in the middle here, uh, we would repeat this pattern. Each hidden layer would only pass inputs to the next. The uh, other side of that, though, is that these uh, connections are fully connected. So each neuron in the in input layer is connected to every neuron in the hidden layer and, and, and so on. Um, and again, this pattern would be repeated for hidden layers as well. Now, here I state that these are typically the case um, because there's no hard and fast rule that says it has to be this way. Um, we certainly don't have to fully connect up all the neurons and we are ha we can have connections leap layers if we want to. Um, uh, we kind of ruin the feed forward nature if we start making our connections start going backwards. Uh, but as long as our connections are going forward, we can still have a feed forward multi-layer network that didn't uh, obey these sort of two rules of thumb, even though these two rules of thumb are pretty common um, when designing these types of networks. So what I wanted to do as an example is try and explore a problem that we saw in the last video, which is that the, uh, the XOR, XOR function, the logical function for computing the XOR, is not a function that can be computed by a single neuron by itself. So we might ask ourselves, well, can we compute it with a network? And in fact, there are, there are multiple networks, many different networks that might compute the XOR function but I'm going to start with kind of a simple one here. Uh, this is what we might call a five neuron XOR gate, depending on how you count your neurons. Sometimes we might want to exclude the input layers neurons uh, from our count because the input layer, again, are not usually neurons that we uh, engage in any kind of learning with. The main purpose of these neurons is just to pass the input along into the hidden layer. And so typically we hardwire these uh, input layer neurons with some weights and thresholds that are just intended to pass input along. So for instance, I've hardwired my input layer here with thresholds of 0.5. Uh, again, we're using a step function here so that any inputs that are over 0.5 will uh, cause the uh, neuron to fire or output a 1. Otherwise, we get a 0 output or no firing. Um, and so we can imagine here uh, inputs coming in for the, you know, whatever input might be coming into this neuron here, it's either going to be a 0 or a 1. We're just going to take that input raw and multiply it by 1. So it's just take that input in and compare it to 0 0.5. So if it's less than, if it's 0, we get a 0 coming out. And if it's a greater than, it's 1, we get a 1 coming out. So all that this input layer is going to do, or this input neuron and, and both my input neurons are the same, is just pass the input on. So you can think of these neurons as really just forking the input because the real important thing they're doing here is splitting that input into two and sending one down this path to this neuron and one down this path to this neuron and similarly for this neuron over here. So the, you know, the purpose of the input layer is usually just to take that input in raw, pass it along, raw or as, as raw as it can um, and uh, do that to all of the neurons that are needed that need that input information in the network in this case all of our neurons in the hidden layer and I've just elected to have two in this case so in this case it's just a simple binary branch but in other cases we're usually branching that data out into a lot of different uh, uh, neurons now I mentioned sometimes we might not count these input neurons as being part of our network for this reason. And that's, so, you know, in that case, uh, we might imagine, well, maybe the input isn't actually just passed on through neurons here. We just forked the, the input in our own way, you know, some other way uh, outside of the neural network. And we just make sure that all of the neurons in the hidden layer are getting all of the inputs passed into them. That's a less standard way to wire up 
your networks or to describe your network. So I'm using this method in my uh, diagram here that indicates that we do use authentic neurons in the input layer. And in fact, in my uh, implementation that uh, I'll be sharing in a future video, I do indeed put these neurons in there and I just hardwire them with these, well, something similar to these values here. I don't use a, a step function. In my example, I use a sigmoid function, so I have some slightly different values for the neuron, but I'm still just passing that data uh, through as easily as I can with the sigmoid function. Okay, so that's our input layer. It's just gonna pass the, uh, the inputs on. And remember, we're trying to compute the XOR function. So now we have these two hidden neurons that we can put to different uses. And in fact, um, you know, this might be a good time if you want to, as an exercise, uh, pause the video and try and imagine, well, how can I design my input layer and my out or my sort of my hidden layer and my output layer here to get uh, the XOR function computed properly. Um, and if you if you did pause the video and you did try that out, then you know that there's maybe more than one way that you can solve this. So if you get came up with a way to solve this and it's different than the way that I'm going to show right now, that's fine because there's more than one way. In fact, there's more than the ways that I'm just going to outline here today. So uh, the way that uh, I uh, first envision doing this, in fact, there's two uh, ways that leap immediately to mind to me, is that if you look at the XOR function, and uh, you'll notice that there are two of the possible inputs that we should say yes on, or we should output one or true for, and that's if one and not the other of the inputs is set to one. So we might get a one on the first input and a zero on the second or a zero on the first input and a one on the second, those are the two inputs that we might wanna say yes on. So what I wanna do is I wanna design my hidden layer neurons to detect those specific cases and only those specific cases. So for instance, the first one might be a one on the first input and a zero on the second input I want this hidden neuron to say one or yes or true only when that input is coming in. Any other input I want to say no. Again, for the moment, think to yourself how, might, how you might make that happen. And then I want the second neuron to do the exact same thing, but just the opposite case so that when the second neuron is one, I want this one to fire and, and, sorry, and, and the first one is zero. In all other cases, I want it to fire uh, or not fire at all and just have an output of zero. So how can we make this happen? So the thing we need to realize, it might be a little bit challenging if we don't realize we need to use a negative weight in here to help us cancel out a specific case. So first of all, let's just look at the positive weight first. We wanted to make sure that this hidden layer fired when, or this hidden neuron specifically, when our first input was one. So we, our first input gets passed along uh, raw through the input layer. We know that's how we designed it. So if a one's coming in here, we know a one's coming down here. And, and I've multiplied by this one, so now it's straight on through coming through. And so we're using the same threshold of 0 0.5 saying, if that one signal is coming through here, we want it to pass on and continue to pass on. The problem is we now have this second signal coming in over here. And as long as that signal is a zero, we're good to go. We want to pass that on. But if that other signal is a one, we want to cancel out whatever we're doing at down here. So we know that there's a signal of one coming in here. If this one's sending a signal of one, it's multiplied by minus one, minus one plus one coming from the other branch gives us zero. And so we cancel out in this case, if we get both of them are at our ones, in which case this will go back, our, our, our value goes to zero, which is less than our threshold, and we end up getting the zero that we desire. So again, we can test the other two cases. If they're both zeros coming in, zero, zero, okay, we get zero. Or a zero coming on this one and a one coming on this one, we actually get minus one. And minus one is of course still less than 0 0.5. And so all of those will fire zero. Now this neuron is symmetrical, so all I've done is swap the two weights. Instead of having one coming from the first one and minus one from the second one, I have minus one coming from the first one and one coming from the second one. So this neuron's just going to detect the opposite case. 
So we've got these two set up properly to detect. Again, the, the left neuron here detects the case one zero and the right neuron here detects the case zero one. So now what do we need to do with our output layer to make it output the correct answer? So again, just think about that yourself for a second. Maybe if you again need to pause it and, and work it out on your own as an exercise, what we need to do here is we need to detect if either or of the either one of these is is firing. So the or function is what we want to build into our output layer. And we did that in our last video. So I'll just remind us how we did that. We're going to just pass the input through with a, uh, a weight of one. And then we're just going to check to see if it's greater than 0 0.5. That way, if either one of them happens to fire off, then we will fire off, which is good because that means we've detected one of those two cases, either the one zero on the left one or the zero one on the right one. And we can also maybe ask ourselves here, well, what happens in the case if they're both firing? Well, in fact, that's going to be impossible because if this one is one zero, it's firing, then we know that this one will have a minus one and a zero coming in as a result, and it will not be firing. So it's impossible for both of these hidden neurons to fire at the same time. Only one or the other is ever going to be on. And that's fine for us because whichever one is on, that's the actual case that we've detected and we want to make sure we pass that along. So this is one example of a uh, five neuron XOR gate for uh, feed forward multilayer gate. Again, it's very simple using binary valued neurons and it's using a threshold fun a step function. Uh, but we can now see that we can actually compute the XOR uh, function with five neurons. And again, if we're stickler for counting our neurons, we can, we can strip out the two input ones and say this is a three neuron gate if you'd like uh, as well. Um, so one question that might come to mind then is there are other ways that we can design our five neuron network for the XOR. And certainly there actually are, I mentioned that earlier. Um, we, can we can leave the hardwiredness in for our input layer if we want, but the other one that kind of leaps to my mind uh, kind of immediately is using an AND gate and an OR gate. And the reason is sometimes when we define what XOR is in a logical uh, example, and so maybe when we're, we're teaching logic class and we are trying to um, distinguish between inclusive or and exclusive or. So what do we say? Well, the definition that kind of flows off natural language is something like it means either A or B, but not both A or B. And so there's some logic in there. And let me let me break it down a little bit. So the first one is it's either A or B. That's the what we're saying there is inclusive or we're saying it's either or, but and then we go and say, but not both. And what but, first of all, what does but mean? But is just a fancy way to say and in, in natural language that prepares our listener to know that the thing that's coming after this and is going to have a not in it. We say but, and then usually there's something negative that comes after that. But but is really just an and. Okay, so, so we're saying here it is either or, either or, but, which is a secret and, not both. And not both is another and. The both part means both A and B. So what we're saying is it is A or B and not A and B. So the idea here is if we wanted to, we could build up one of our neurons to be an A or B, and we could have another one be an A and B. And then we just have to figure out how to get that output neuron to be the but not part, the but not, okay? Because it is an and, but it's a but not, okay? So we need to have that, one of them needs to be negated. So I'll leave that as an exercise, okay? You can probably find solutions on, online. Um, try it out and, and see if you can design another five neuron XOR gate. Now it turns out there are even other five neuron uh, XOR functions, especially if you uh, move from step functions to threshold functions. And um, I might talk a little bit more about that in my next video. Uh, but before we get to that, the, the last thing I wanted to leave you with 
is that this uh, network that we've been looking at is not actually the smallest network for the XOR function. You can actually build a network with four neurons and here's the network topology. Topology just meaning shape. This is the shape of the neural network that you would need to solve the XOR gate. So this is a slightly more challenging uh, um, exercise, but I'll leave you with this as well. Try it out. Um, can you find the weights um, thresholds for step functions? So we're still using binary valued and uh, threshold, uh, threshold based step functions for our activation functions. Can you find the weights and thresholds to make this work? Okay. Now notice to make it work with four neurons, we had to violate the, the sort of rule of thumb that we indicated earlier. We said earlier that every uh, um, layer is only connected to the next layer. That's something we're skipping here by allowing a connection to go all the way from the input to the output. Okay. Now again, there might be more than one way to solve this. I only can think of one way off the top of my head right this moment, so there might be more. Um, but the way that I'm thinking of also kind of follows the or but not both strategy. Okay. So try that out if you're interested. Again, if you uh, find a solution, maybe um, uh, let me know in the comments down below. Otherwise, um, uh, I will check you in that next video where we will talk about evolving a neural network to solve the XOR uh, function. Uh, so thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you in that next video.